Barnard's book shines a light on the struggles of those living with trauma and encourages appreciation of the healing powers of unconditional love. Connor's trauma survivor journey as a Vietnam veteran and an adult child of an alcoholic, assisted by his work as a recovery therapist, as an enthusiast of outdoor adventure. As led to writing, primarily nonfiction, he hopes his writing inspires others struggling to heal from trauma. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, Connor Logan. Member of the Sunrise Club, Ms. Van Barber, right? Yes. Thank you for having me uh, come today. Uh, greetings to all of you fellow Rotarians and guests today. Uh, I have a come on, little device here, my cheating device. Okay. Um, the uh, presentation today is entitled uh, Shepherding. Whoops. Okay. Alright, quick back. Shepherding a manuscript to publication. I'm a uh, debut author. And I just had a book, a uh, memoir, published this past couple of weeks, March 23rd. And so I want to talk today, I want to do three things for you. I want to talk about my experience of shepherding that to publication, my writing in to some degree, and uh, marketing. Let's see if this works. Yay. Okay. Now, before I, I was told and encouraged before I do anything with trying to get a book published for marketing, I have to brand myself. And one of the things that's being done today is developing a website. So I spent six months working with a consultant, developed the website. And there's a little bit of teaser about what I'm doing on social media. And I like that quote at the bottom. That's helped me move along in my life. By Winston Churchill, I really have grown to appreciate that man. I think he was quite uh, intelligent. Fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. Now, books life. First, you got to write the thing. A writer usually sits in quiet solitude. It's not always the case. Uh, a writer will seek support from others like a critique group, editors, uh, beta readers, people online, or whatever. Uh, but once it's put into a draft form, then it gets rewritten and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. And, rewritten. and eventually, as Leonardo da Vinci says, the author finally abandons it and says, enough is enough. And I gotta move on. Uh, the writer seeks validation from others, feedback from others, and finally concludes that the manuscript is ready for publication or the trash can, or sits it aside for a while, perhaps comes back to it later or not. Um, authors are audacious in believing they not only that people will want to read what they write, but people will pay to do so. Now, when you're writing something, and I think we all in this country, all of us in this room, and, and a lot of us in this country know how to write. I started writing this out when I was in the first grade. But the trick is writing something that people want to read. So the first thing you do when writing something, if you're going to get published or you want to get published, do you pick a genre? In this case, I pick memoir. I'm more into that. It's easier for me to recall what happened to me and put that on paper than it is to dream up science fiction. And you find a theme that the book has throughout to tie it all together. I pick family dysfunction. Choosing an inciting incident. In this case, this is the hook that gets people interested in the book. And it tells them why you wrote the book. And maybe, hopefully, why they should read it. In this case, I picked a phone call with my mother. A hook is like the first line, first paragraph of any book, and it's like sinking the hook into a fish. You gotta get the hook in the fish before you catch the fish and reel it in. The idea of the hook is something that's really interesting and grabs the reader's attention. In this case, I picked shutting doors. The idea of shutting doors. 
then you have to develop the characters in the story. And with the help of an editor, I alternated my chapters between basically two settings. One, my home environment with my parents, and farming environment visiting my maternal grandparents' subsistence rural farm in Kentucky. Now, once you get something written, and you usually have a lot of feedback in revising it and revising it, if you want to publish, you got, well, you have four options. One at the bottom there, you don't publish, you give it away basically. You either throw it in the trash or you post it on social media or you mail it to your relatives. If you want to get it published, the first thing people think of is the traditional method with a bed at the top, which is a publisher. Big, big company. Um, they take all kinds of, um, they listen to agents. Agents try to sell them a book. And they will take a book if they think it's, they're going to make money on it because they're in the business to make money. And usually, as I understand it, about one out of every 10 books now uh, that a publisher will take on, they expect it to, to, they hope to hit big. So the percentages of books that they take on, even that are really successful and sell a lot, is uh, kind of a small percentage. But because of developments in the past 30 years or so with computers and the internet, the author now basically has the burden to do their own platform, build their own platform, get their own and generate their own audience. Distribution is not something that big publishers do anymore. A lot of bookstores have gone out of business. A lot of things are online now. So the author has to build a platform. Generally, an author will have to secure an agent, but not always. Some big publishers will take on uh, directly a submission from a, uh, an author. And what happens with a traditional publisher is they you sign a contract, they'll give you some money up front, depending on how much they think they're going to sell, and then they'll give you royalties on the back end. Now, one of the things that's happened with the internet more recently, and a lot of people getting into the business and having experience, is a development of something called a hybrid publisher, who an author can contract with, and they'll do a lot of the work to help get the book published, not all of it, for a fee. So the author pays them to do certain things, not everything. The uh, writer then still has control of the manuscript or the book, and they get more of the money at the end. So the writer pays more up front, they get more at the end, and they own the book throughout, as opposed to self-publishing where the author does everything by himself except here and there they might have to pay for some service. Uh, Self-publishing, you pay up front and get everything at the end. So the author takes all the financial responsibility. I chose to go hybrid publishing. And here's what I did with my hybrid publisher, and there's a number of them out there. I edited the manuscript and I submitted it to them. And I included in that was my bio, my book summary, and book blurbs that I was secured from other writers. I wrote uh, the dedication page, the acknowledgments page, table of contents. I selected and sent in photos, black and white, and I captioned those. I proofed and approved everything throughout the development. So again, I had ownership and control of it. I've got the rights to the book. I opened an Amazon Books page and a Smashwords account. I applied for copyright once the proof was done. And optionally, additionally, I obtained a California seller's permit and opened a Square account, which is a card swipe for your phone. Ten minutes there. Ten minutes. We're already at ten. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gotta move on. Here's what they did. They helped design the page. They formatted everything. They obtained the ISBN. They uploaded everything to Amazon Books and Smashwords. They contracted with a printing company. They suggested the sale price. 
They provided hand holding. And they needed it. Now comes the marketing. And I've been using Facebook, LinkedIn, and more recently YouTube. Um, I have to take the responsibility to try to secure book reviews through newspapers. Pay for advertising if I choose, and I probably will with Amazon. Uh, conduct book readings and signings, such as today. And then podcasting my work on podcasts to increase my audience awareness. Not so great, doesn't look so great in this slide, but that's a uh, image of the top portion of my homepage on my website. There's a lot of work that went into that. Just some interesting information for you. I looked this up on the internet. I think well, it's probably mostly true. Uh, new titles, according to UNESCO, here are the four days they picked uh, new titles and new books in 2003, 300,000. 2011, 3 million. That's one year according to their figures. Now, and I found another interesting figure. As of August 10, of 2010, that's 12 years ago now, the number of books in existence. And I hate to dissuade you that if you have reading every book on your bucket list, you'll never do it. <laughs> there are over, as of 2010, 129 million separate books that are in existence. Now, if you think of the, yeah, that figure right there, that comes after 2010. You, with this exponentially growing, particularly with COVID, I've heard a lot of writers, a lot of people have been writing, so publications are gonna go up. We're well over that figure right now. It's phenomenal to me. Just a little quiz, one at a time to go, what's a debut author? Well, I'm a debut author, that's the first time. Beta readers are people who look at a book and they'll give you feedback. This works, that doesn't. Scare quotes, right there. Quote, 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 quote. Those are scare quotes. I'm told uh, they reduce author's credibility, so I'm trying to cut back on the use of those. Writer's block, I don't believe it exists. If a writer sits down, they can't write what they want to write, then just start writing anything, and then it begins to flow, and you go from there, and you let it take you where it will. What's a favorite comment? That's the little thing up in the top corner. Usually, when you see a URL, you open your browser. That little picture, thumbnail picture, that's a favorite comment. And one I really like. What's a dinkus? Dinkus is three asterisks in a row that's used to separate text as at a shifting time or place. Sometimes we use um, hash marks, but I told Dinkus is better. Okay, you can contact me a number of ways. There's a photo of my book cover. Uh, I have some here, by the way. I'll get the desk in the back after the meeting. There we go. Okay, now where are we? I want to provide, uh, how much time are we doing on our second segment? Yeah, well, um, about 15 minutes. You've gone, we've got 15 minutes left. Okay. I'm just going to go from the beginning and offer you a little bit of a reading here from the book. Um, and excuse me if I get the clip. But I wrote this specifically in mind to try to dig as deep as I could into my emotions about these situations with the idea that if I felt them when I wrote them, that if other people read them, they will probably feel them or likely as well. And that's the whole idea of, of something being attractive to the reader. Uh, this is from the first chapter, Frank and Ada, 1996. Another door had slammed shut. Your Aunt Shirley and I went down there to look at the farm and the house, Mom had told me over the phone. The new owner let us in. You should see it. They remodeled the inside. It's gorgeous. They put it in a spiral staircase. It was the glossy white door to the secret passage that goes upstairs gone to? After we'd lost Dad, Mom and I talked long distance on a weekly basis. We worked to shore up our relationship and make up for the years of sparse contact since I moved to California. 
I witnessed a stream of changes regarding the farm and those there who had cocooned me in their loving care. Those changes had seemed incremental, taken one by one. When grouped together, however, they led me to the realization, impossible to ignore, that what I hadn't already lost from my childhood, I would soon, I would do so in the not too distant future. And for me, the farm and oasis from the turmoil I faced at home had been vitally important in my childhood, more so than I realized then. After Mom and I had said our goodbyes, memories began to flood in, and I recalled the last time I'd seen Grandma and Grandpa together on the farm. The farm had looked tired and unkempt, a lesser version of the one I'd remembered. I checked the nearest of the two rain barrels that bookended the front porch of the house, had to. Looked deep into the barrel to see what little water remained, then picked up the well-worn footpath between the house and garage. That dirt path, that dirt path, a hard packed shallow rut had been there as far back as I could remember. Its gentle curve, carved through uncut grass, led me to the large, irregular marble slab that acted as the back doorstep. Northbound in Mom and Dad's car after a visit to haunts at my own model, Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, I pulled off I-65 at the Upton exit. Now on Interstate Highway, we know I-65 as a toll road when the section between Louisville and Elizabethtown had opened in 1956, and you had to pay to use it. I had not seen my maternal grandparents for several years, but I hadn't traveled back to Kentucky, money in short supply, and I decided I no longer needed to rely on Mom and Dad to visit Grandma and Grandpa. I always call my grandparents that on both sides, always will. I paused at the marble slab at the, at the kitchen door. I never trusted that rock, a little tilted with a hump in the middle and great and slippery when wet. The back door stood open to let in air, though the screen door was shut. The kitchen was unoccupied. With a loud knock, I called, Hello? Grandma appeared through the doorway from the living room. Hi, Grandma, I said. Even though the screen, I, even through the screen, I noticed she had grown frail, and I spotted a rag wrapped around her right ankle. Well, hi, son. Come on in. She flashed that friendly, enthusiastic smile I had always known. She'd always call me son, and I liked that. Made me feel closer to her, and special every time she did. Even though she referred to all my male cousins that way too. I stepped inside. What happened to your leg, Grandma? Oh, I caught my ankle on the screen door the other day, she pointed. See, on that corner there, a sheet of the aluminum door ripped loose at the bottom and curled into an unintended knife edge with an even more menacing corner. That looks dangerous, Grandma. I bled and bled, thought I was going to bleed to death. Well, and there it was, the possibility no, the inevitability of her death and my loss of Grandma forever. I'm glad you did, Grandma. I said as I choked back my sadness. I'll be all right, I think. I hope so, would she? A tea towel, as Grandma called them, served as a bloody bandage. Let me see if I can fix that door, I said. I'll stop there. Okay. I'm going to offer opportunity for questions. I'm not sure about the answers, but whatever. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, what's the difference, or why did you pick doing a memoir instead of an autobiography? Good question. An autobiography is a full length of the life of an author written by the author, whereas a biography is a full length written by someone else about the author oh. or a person. A memoir is a slice of life. It's a theme based on a theme. In my case, my theme is growing up in a dysfunctional family. Juxtapose scenes from my mother, being with my mother and father at home, and then visiting the farm. So it's a slice of life. So in that sense, an author can have multiple memoirs. Uh, I think I saw your hand first, sir. 
In choosing the hybrid publishing, I, I'm curious because it was certainly my experience that the difference between publisher and self-publishing was that yeah, you get you get more, you have more control, things like that. But it also pretty much removes you from the opportunity of being any uh, Barnes and Nobles, you know, kind of national bookstores. And I was wondering if that was also true with the hybrid, because I saw that most of most of your advertising and some publishing was through Amazon and, and that sort of thing. So is it restricted in that way? It's a good question, and I don't know if I have the full answer. I think because of what's been happening this past 20, 30 years, it's shifted. A lot of bookstores have gone out of business, like Barnes & Noble, and we just have a paltry few here in the Santa Barbara, greater Santa Barbara area. Yeah. Um, it is true that in the past, um, because the, the traditional publishers had distribution through bookstores, that, that if you were self-published, you were kind of cut out of that opportunity or market. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I'm not so sure that's the case. Um, I did talk with a fellow, I won't mention his name just recently, who is a distributor for authors in the San, writing books that are related to the Santa Barbara area. Mm -hmm. And he's not working for a traditional publisher or through a, a traditional publisher. So I think it's eased up and it's much more fluid now. Uh, basically, a hybrid publisher, it, if, if an author goes to a hybrid publisher, it's the same, it's considered the same as self-publishing. Mm -hmm. But I also had talked with one author who wrote a book, um, and all he did for his marketing was pay for Amazon advertising. Mm -hmm. And he's made a lot of money. Whereas most, most authors don't, can't make a living right mm -hmm. nowadays anyway. So it's, it's a very fluid. Um, and I can't say for sure, but I think there are a lot of, probably a lot of opportunities out there for people who use hybrid or self-published to be able to distribute. Yeah. And, and I would, if you're not at Chaucer's, but you're booking Chaucer's. Oh, by the way, just, thank you. I just uh, recall that I have um, scheduled a book signing for May 9th at Chaucer's. And that will be my first public uh, book signing. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yes, sir. A couple of questions. Um, in the process of you writing, um, what was your purpose or goal, number one? And number two, at what point and how did you discern that it was ready for somebody else to care about your book? Okay, two good questions. Um, and maybe the problem with your both questions. Let me start with the second one. I got tired of writing it. I had written it and written it and written it and gotten feedback about from this person, that person, this critique group, that critique group. And I decided, well, if I'm going to do something with it, I have to have a professional editor to do it. So I had a friend who was a professional editor and I said, please edit. She did. I reworked it based on that. And at that point, I said, like Leonardo da Vinci, I'm going to abandon this, it's done as far as I'm concerned, and I have to release it into the wild, so take the next step and get it published. Back to your first question, can you repeat that and remind me? What was your, what, your purpose in writing it in the first place? Purpose. Well, I think one thing as a memoir was cathartic. Um, I do believe that as you recall things, if you reminisce, uh, it will force you, if you're writing it, to put it on paper, to look at it and put it more into a context and understand it, whereas if we let it stay floating around in our mind, we're not so clear about it. I think I also wanted to write it as a way to honor those that I grew up with who loved me, who I loved, and kind of memorializing that was the best way I could do it. Um, I was, I, as a retired marriage and family therapist, I wanted, I, I hoped uh, to achieve uh, that other people would gain inspiration from it as well. So I think those are all part, and there may be some other reasons too. It's, it's a multifaceted, uh, as most things are, it's multifaceted. Thank you. Yes, sir. I've had a career producing distance education materials that 
are used in the automotive field, the car and truck sales. And many, many years ago, I went to a little seminar where the speaker challenged us that you have to write to be read. Are you writing just to get a great feeling about yourself and see all the words I can put together? Isn't that great? Yeah. Somebody has to read this stuff. So don't write for yourself. Write for the person who's going to be reading it and doing something with it. That's been pretty good advice. Yeah. Well, that is true. You, um, for whatever motivation the writer has, you want to be able to, if, if you want other people to read it. I think I just lost my hope. Um, certainly you have to write it in a fashion and form that other people will be interested in reading it. Um, and that's where finding the audience comes in for the, uh, the author. You've got to find your audience or, or write to your audience. Um, I have one. Yeah. So you were sharing your, your book early on with critique groups and so on. How soon did you copyright it because you were sharing it and your storyline was out there to keep someone from picking it up and stealing it? Good question. I think I copyrighted it once it was on Amazon, which was this past few weeks, uh, partly because the copyright um, office said you can't copyright until it's available to the public. Go figure. If you write something and you've got a record of it, you, it's already yours. It's copyrighted in that same side. For me though, uh, and I think for a lot of people who use critique groups, you have to trust the people in your group. They're not going to rip it off. And you certainly don't just stick it on a blog and, and say, give me some feedback. I'm writing, this is part of my book. You don't want to put it out in public. So you use a selected, trusted uh, group of individuals. And, and it works, I think, well. I mean, everybody that's in the same boat is, I don't rip you off, you don't rip me off. Yes, sir? So this is what, part of what I do as a lawyer. Um, but you own the copyright as soon as you put creative work in a tangible medium. So um, you, you registered the copyright. That you already own. That's a good differentiation. Thanks. But um, <clears throat> did you have to uh, enter into some contract with any of the people that were helping you get it out there? And did you specifically reserve rights for sequel and film and all that kind of stuff? Yes. Um, I didn't have a written contract with the editor, it was a verbal contract, but again, it was based on trust. I uh, contracted with her to edit. Mm -hmm. And then I contracted in writing with Authority Publishing, the hybrid publisher, to um, actually put it in format and get it out there for me. Um, but I own all the rights to it. They, I, I paid them to, to facilitate getting it in a form that it could be printed and online so it could be and post it to Amazon and Smashwords so people can order it on um, Kindle or full Kindle. So I'll try to answer your questions. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of this could be a movie, it could be a play, it could be lots of other things. And I was just hoping that you would say you didn't give up any of those rights. <laughs> no, didn't give up any rights whatsoever. I can do whatever I want with it. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, again, I'll be, I'll be in the back for a little while to answer questions, and hopefully if anybody's interested in, in uh, purchasing a copy, I'll be happy to autograph it for you and uh, give you a bookmark and, and go from there.